Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to a another edition of Beyond the Album Cover, where we get inside the entertainment industry with those that are in the know and give them their flowers. Why they're here to be celebrated. Nice plug, Craig. I have my man, my good friend. We go way back like two flats in the Cadillac, or four flats in the Cadillac, as they say. <laughs> WAG cohort, my buddy, my compadre out in Nashville doing big things, Mr. Craig Veltry. Craig, welcome to Beyond the Album Cover, my friend. So glad to be here, uh, Jay Mace. Uh, I think that Cadillac you're talking about has now currently been stripping up on blocks at this point, but uh, especially certain parts of Greensboro. But uh, so glad. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> yeah, man. It's a pleasure, man. Like I stated earlier, for the people, we go way back to our WAG days. We're definitely going to get into all of that, your music career, and the whole nine yards. So first off, where are you from originally, and where did your love of music come from, and also your musical influences growing up? That's a very good question. Well, uh, first off, I was born uh, September 20th, 1985, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, Allegheny General Hospital. Uh, Dad is Kid Alum. I'm rock rocking the blue and gold today right now uh, in my fit t-shirt. My sister's your grand, my wife, who went to West Virginia, the backyard brawl lives in my house daily. And, uh, but we, uh, but yeah, I moved to uh, North Carolina when I was about uh, 13, so I kind of bounced around North Carolina. We met up at UNCG, I would say about 09, 010, somewhere in that ballpark. Yeah. And um, so, uh, you know, and uh, during that time, I was, all, I was always uh, playing music. Uh, when I'm, during, 10 was when I first started getting my guitar lessons, um, and uh, I was, writing was always kind of uh, an escape for me. Um, uh, as far as uh, influences, I'd have I'd have to mention John Mayer. I'd, I'd be remiss if I didn't say that because you know I'm 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 16 years old. I'm sitting next to uh, cheerleaders and they're singing singing songs from this gawky, somewhat dorky looking dude who's playing guitar. And I'm a much shorter, gawky looking dude playing guitar, so I kind of latched uh, to, to him. Um, but you know, I mean, music. Uh, Music was always kind of an escape. It was always a uh, thing that I reached for, something that, that you know, kind of occupied my mind. Um, the big influences, I mean, I mentioned John Mayer, Billy Joel, just because he could do anything. Van Halen, because they're Van Halen, they're awesome. Um, lately, a couple of the people I've been really getting into are uh, Tyler Childers, uh, he, he's incredible. Jason Isbell, his step is a revelation. Uh, Chris Stapleton, enough said um i've even kind of got i've even grown to respect a lot uh some of the uh more uh more poppy kind of acts uh, you know your taylor swift through the world um and uh and actually and i get on these really weird kicks lately i've been listening to a lot of uh you'll re you'll appreciate this uh the with the uh uh the uh minnesota wrecking crew kind of kind of sound i've been listening to a lot of, a jan of old school janet lately but uh you know, uh, my, you know, you know, you know me all the time. We talked a lot about this on the time machine when you came on Velcro's vinyl all this time. You know, my 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 taste in music, my reference of music has always been kind of all over the place. And my search over the last uh, twenty years has always been trying to find that center, the very least finding piece, bits and pieces that I can use to uh, make the sound. And uh, my hope is that is what has been uh, developing, not just on my uh, new uh, EP, the Vagabond EP but uh, the stuff that I'm coming out with next year. Mm -hmm. Now, you mentioned Veltri's Vinyl and The Time Machine, both great shows during WAG's film run. During our I only had it appreciated by management. <laughs> yeah, shout out to Jack. And, you know, I just had Josh <laughs> Kimbrough. He was the program director during my time there on the show not too long ago, so it was great chopping up with him. Now, how did you I end up... Jack on. Yeah, how did you end up getting on WAG? How did you hear about it, first off? Well, when I was, uh, I was coming out of uh, Central Piedmont Community College in Charlotte uh, about 2008, and uh, I knew that I wanted to land at a college that had a radio station. I, I, I kind of fancied myself as a uh, media personality. I wanted to, you know, become a news anchor, become a, uh, become some kind, become a VJ, become a DJ, some kind, something of that nature. Um, event, eventually, I, 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 I moved away from that, but uh, I always figured, you know, if I'm going to get a college degree, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be something that uh, 
that I that I could at least ease my way through college through. I remember having this conversation. You remember Jessamyn Stanley, uh, who was the news yes. director at yes, the Uh she, she, uh, doing wonderful things on online as a yoga instructor. Yeah, yeah, I see her numbers. Shout out to Jessamyn. <laughs> um, but uh, I remember we remember, uh, we both uh, have have a commonality that we were both uh, theater kids growing up, and uh, her being the news director and me trying to uh, you know. I don't know. I was kind. Of, I mean, Keith Olbermann was kind of my influence uh, in that uh, at the time. Uh, you know, this you know this this harsh voice. Uh, you know, you know, power to the uh, you know speaking out against the man or whatever. Um, I, I kind of I kind of latched to that. But when we but Je- but Jessamyn and I, you know, being you know the guy doing all the news reads, most of them anyway. Uh, she uh, she and I kind kind of had a rapport, and you know, we were both theater kids, and we were kind of like you know this is kind of like being a theater kid but respectable. So, so that that was kind of, that was kind of my uh, my thought going to UNCG and my and my way of doing it. But the longer I was in uh, college in that program, sitting and you know going through media studies, no disrespect meant to uh, you know Dr. Bain, Professor uh, Professor Donaldson, and all the, and all those people that uh, that you know took the time to uh, to mentor me. Um, I just I, I was realizing that my heart wasn't going to be in it. Uh, you know, they, the way they were teaching how to be a journalist at the time, um, it was going to be a lot of editing, which I don't have the patience really for, uh, a lot of video shooting. You know, I mean, don't, don't let my, uh, don't let my broad shoulders fool you. I don't like carrying stuff that much. And, uh, you know, I, and, you know, I, 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 I was writing these songs and it was kind of, I just kind of, <clears throat> So back on this line from uh, Richard Gere, who played a lawyer in this movie called uh, Primal Fear, and he said, you know, why is a lawyer character didn't want to become a judge? My, my thought was, why do I want to be a referee when I can play? Mm-hmm. I definitely agree with that because the interesting thing that I found about UNCG's program was that was that they combined broadcasting and cinema together because, you know, in most schools, they have them as separate, but it's all about the meshing as one. And I was speaking with Chris Lee. You know Chris Lee. Um, oh, I love so yeah. my Boston Russell. Yeah, shout out to Chris, you know, doing big things at WRL. <laughs> where he's the lead sports anchor and uh, just how WAG was a good fertile training ground for all of us that came through there with him, you, me, Prez, DJS, Section 8, oh, Jessam, um, Josh. I could go on and on of all of the DJs that came through those doors, either through Taylor or Brown. It was the best five years of my life being there. And the one thing that I remember the most was that when you were doing a solo show by yourself, you had maybe about a three, 30 minute record on. You had to go use the bathroom really quick and be back before that record went off because you had nobody to cover for you. And the only time somebody popped in would be when the security guard from the police station next door would go and check in just to make sure there was no creepy crawlies roaming around. <laughs> well, I mean, this is, what, this is exactly why during Belfry's vinyl, uh, there, there's this uh, uh, Yes's second album, Fragile, uh, uh, track one side B, uh, South Side of the Sky, eight minutes long. You know that's why. You know that's when I when I stepped outside of the booth when I threw that tra- when I threw that track on. That was always I always had that. I always played that. If for any reason I had to step away, that's that's why it was on. So you know I I, I knew I had time to you know take a stroll around the building or you know prepare for business. Make a sandwich, uh, run to the corner store, <laughs> or go to my favorite haunt in UNCG next to Yum Yums, New York Pizza. Ooh, I love New York pizza. Yeah, New I, I York- actually tried, I tried to get booked there a couple of times. You know, just uh, when I was doing the uh, doing the uh, startup when I was just touring around North Carolina. So, mm-hmm. you know, yep. Yeah, so yeah. for those of you yeah. that are planning on visit Greensboro, go down to Tate Street, go to New York Pizza, tell them Jay Mason Craig sent you. Maybe they'll give you a discount off of some pizza or a T-shirt. But their food got me through not a whole bunch of final exams and late nights at the station. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, now they have a wing joint down uh, down there as well on Tate Street Coffee. They actually did book me, so much love to them. Ah, sure. oh, oh, man. Yeah, like I said, it's been years since I've been up to UNCG, and a lot has changed, man, like the new buildings that's been popping up. And one of the residence halls got a diner 
in the facility where kids yeah. can actually eat and they have a Bojangles on the yeah. inside. Now, for those of you who are unfamiliar with the South and North Carolina in general, Bojangles is a treasure. Don't at me. Don't fight me. Don't debate me. It's not better than Popeyes. It's not better than Chick Fil A. It's not better than churches. It's not better than churches. It's not better than Miss Winners. I'm telling you. Tell me of a chicken joint where you can get a two piece meal and a Cajun fillet biscuit in bow rounds all day, mm. all day long. Uh, well, I think you got him there, Jamie. <laughs> yes, 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 I surely do, man. So you do anything at the radio station. Now, at this time, were you thinking about doing the music thing while you were in school or that came about more so after graduation? I often say that time was uh, me keeping my music on the incubator. I I wasn't doing. I didn't have a PA system at the time. Really, the only uh, things that I was doing. I mean, there were uh, two places that I would really uh, really hang out at, uh, and it was on uh, Walker Avenue, Walker Bar, and the and the original Blind Tiger. Uh, shout out to uh, Richard Donaldson, who actually did give me my only paying gig when they moved the Blind Tiger over to. Um, off Spring, I think it's Spring Garden Street where uh, where it is, like like little ways from Jake's as far. Oh. Um, and uh, you know, I, I I did a showcase there, that, uh, made made a couple bucks uh, on my way out. But uh, really, I was just doing open mics. I was just writing to uh, you know kill time. And uh, at the time, uh, put uh, my most of my writing from that time was me just uh, writing tombstones for uh, for girls who uh, who shunned me or vice versa. You know. You know, you know how, you know how it's wild boys were, you know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but uh, so, but no. At, at the time, cut a demo or two. Um, did, was doing the open mic, writing when I could. Um, but uh, did I see a career out of it? Yeah. Still, I figured, you know, I, you know, maybe I'd intern at the uh, intern at one one of the TV stations. Maybe I'd intern at one of the uh, radio stations. Or maybe I what wound up happening. Maybe I just wind up uh, working, uh, you know, working for uh, for Eckerd Drug at the time. I was I was. Let me let me give you an idea of my my schedule, Jamie. Uh, during one of the uh, one of my last years at, uh, at at UNCG, I was the uh, I was the, my last semester there. I was the treasurer of my fraternity, Theta Delta Chi. I was working at the. Uh, I was doing the workshop class. That's how I came about the WUAG to answer an earlier question. I was writing columns and doing uh, doing some stories for the Carolinian, the school newspaper, hosting a game show on Spartan TV, and some weeks working 40 hours at, at, at Ecker. Um, I did not sleep much that final semester, um, but but I but I was uh, putting a few stakes down, you know, just to just to get 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 the uh, Get the future rolling. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, it uh, music, but music was music wasn't the answer, and it really wasn't the answer until I realized I didn't want to be on TV, I didn't want to be on the radio unless it was in this kind of kind of a capacity. Hence, vagabond. Um, so, and uh, and quickly I realized that I didn't, that I never really wanted to, you know. If, if if I had a choice, I never really wanted to never really wanted to punch a clock ever again. So or answer to a boss. So um, it, it took me a while, and it it I everybody said it was a brave step, but I I I look at it and it was, it was a step that I had no choice but to take, mm. and that's why I'm here in Nashville. Yeah. Man, your schedule was not for the weary Red Bull and some other carbonated beverages along with M&M's, Skittles, insert whatever, chocolate, delectable delights you like, all of the champions. It was mostly coffee, actually. I, I, I you know, I, I mean, I like a good uh, Diet Coke, Coke Zero every now and again. I tried Red Bull. I tried Five Hour Energy. Say about Five Hour Energy. It's like, it was like it keeps you awake, but it's like the kind of tired that you feel, but you can't close your eyes. It's really weird. So it's like when you snort a white substance and you're all energy, ready to go. And if you don't know what that is, go look at Scarface. Go look at Scarface. That's 
was going to say, go look at Spider-Man. I, 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 I mean, I, I don't know what you're talking about, but uh, say goodnight to the bad yeah, guy. Yeah, some of y'all was probably doing that with pixie sticks back in elementary school. <laughs> <laughs> or, or Kool-Aid packets. <laughs> oh, <God>. uh, <laughs> if they were, I wasn't hanging out with them. Oh, my God. Yeah, man, that's a weird rabbit hole, man. And I know you kind of dabbled a little bit in indie wrestling, correct? Yes. Um, I, uh, in fact, we, we talked about Chris Lee. Um, I, uh, I was, uh, so when I graduated uh, from UNCG with that degree in media studies, and a minor in English, by the way, and uh, I found that, I, I, meant, I mentioned the mechanics of what prevented me from going to working for a news station or anything like that. And and it was a very cynical move, but the way I figured it, if I'm going to BS people, I may as well let them know it. So I had a friend of mine from high school uh, named uh, Manuel Sadek, uh, better known to uh, his uh, friends and compatriots as Manny Mack. And Manny um, had an organization down in Charlotte called XWW, Extreme World Wrestling. Um, and we had talked throughout college. He was doing shows. Uh, he went to Western Carolina, and he was running shows up there. Uh, he bought the shows. He, brought, he was bringing the shows back to Charlotte, and I hit him up just thinking, you know, you know, maybe he already has a, an announcer or whatever. And you know, I just wanted to get in, you know, do ring crew or you know, just kind of, kind of get my, my see, see what it was about. And he's like, hey, dude, come on in, do do some play by play. And that that's how that started. Uh, eventually, I got uh, got the attention of a uh, premier wrestling experience, PWX. Um, that. Uh, which uh, then, which was kind of connected through High Spots, which is a, a wholesale distributor of wrestling products. You can buy pretty much anything: uh, action figures, books, belts, whole wrestling rings. In fact, their big contract is that pretty much every wrestling uh, company from AEW, uh, Impact, WWE, they buy their mats from them. So that's that's where they get a lot of their money from. Uh, PWS was kind of latching on to them at the time. And they brought me in uh, pretty much for everything. I did some play-by-play. I did some ring announcing, did some backstage interviews, attempted to uh, start up a, a, an online program called uh, the PWX Update Desk, uh, which had a bunch of hiccups and a bunch of stops and starts. And, uh, you know, it just didn't, uh, didn't really have a consistent run. But uh, eventually I landed with, uh, in, in Greensboro, Firestar Pro Wrestling, run by a great guy by the name of uh, LeBron Koza. And uh, he, uh, you know, he uh, brought me in on the recommendation of uh, one of the guys in PWX, uh, with, and I had a lot of fun. We ran the shows out of the, uh, the Boys and Girls Club uh, in Greensboro, and it was always uh, a nice way for me to get back to my fraternity brothers, you know, visit, visit Greensboro, uh, which I've always had a soft spot in my heart for, uh, for that area. And that's where I met Chris Lee. And, uh, you know, he was, he was wrestling some spots for them. He started out with uh, this uh, company out of Gibsonville, uh, uh, CWF. I want to say Carolina Wrestling Federation. I could be wrong with what the C stood for. But, uh, you know, I met him, met, a, met, met several uh, incredible talents just between, the, between those two federations. Uh, let, me give, let me give you a roster of people that I got to call, cover, or interview, um, or just uh, pass uh, uh, through the night. Matt Hardy, Adam Cole, who I think as of right now, actually, no, he fought for the NXT uh, title, but he's been the NXT champion already. Uh, Roddy Strong, who uh, at one point was the uh, North American champion. Um, uh, Dash Wilder, uh, who is uh, uh, in a t- who's currently one half of the AEW Tag Team Champion. I think he's uh, Dash Harwood, I think he's, he's called. They, they switched the names whenever they left WWE. Um, Tommy Dreamer, I got a chance to interview him. Um, Steve Carino, who is now a uh, now a trainer up for WWE. Um, you know, so 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 many. Um, I'll, I'll tell this story. I've told this story once or twice on another uh, on another podcast. Um, so I uh, when I released my first record, A Million Miles to Go, uh, PWX uh, put on a a, a concert. Uh, for Mickey James, uh, the former, who's now with WWE and she's a former champion, uh, hands down, shoe in Hall of Famer, one of the best women's wrestlers of all time. 
And um, she's also a country singer. Um, so she had, she had a record out. We did a show, Tremont Music Hall. And Tremont Music Hall had a main room and a Cavs ballroom, which was a smaller stage. So after the show in the main room, we had, we had, they had the show for her, and I opened for her. I uh, played pretty much my entire album. I played for about two hours in front of, uh, in front of a couple of uh, uh, confused wrestling fans. <laughs> but, uh, nah, and, uh, in fact, Kevin Owens, who, uh, who was a former WWE champion as well, was actually, uh, was actually in the room as well, which is kind of cool. And Adam Page, who's with uh, AEW now. Um, anyway, I do my show. Uh, Mickey does her show. We meet up in backstage, and I don't know about you, I, I, I don't like, uh, I'm not one of those people that like pounds for autographs, I'm not really much of a collector of that, and also, it, 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 it's just, it's, you know, I'm on camera with most of these people. I have proof, I have proof that I've met these people, so I, 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 tend not to bo- I tended not to bother them with that. I tended to bother them enough anyway when, as, I'm, as I'm getting research down for, for, for play-by-play and stuff. But, um, Anyway, we're backstage. Mickey and her band are already on their second fifth of Jack Daniels' Tennessee Honey. And, you know, when am I going to get the chance? We did a show together. Let's get a picture, Mickey. So I hand my phone off to her guitar player, wrap my arm around Miss James. She leans in and licks my neck. <laughs> now, keep in mind, at the time, she was not uh, with uh, Magnus who, or... Uh, Oh, what's his name now? Uh, Nick Aldis, who was a former NWA uh, heavyweight champion most recently. So I don't, I don't know about the relationship at the time or what she was going, what was going on. But 13 year old me came about and just melted right in front of her. So, <laughs> but uh, yeah, uh, wrestling was fun. <laughs> I guess my my general point. <laughs> right, and if you're not from the south, it is pronounced wrestling. Wrestling. W r a s t l i n wrestling and the south north carolina especially plays a big role in the state of professional wrestling jim crockett promotions ran yeah. the carolinas and then once Vic mcmahon decided to take wrestling and make it national he gobbled up all of the small regional territories to make it one big brand and then good old ted turner down in atlanta georgia decided to take the wrestling promotion down in Georgia, we christened that WCW, and hence came the Monday Night Wars between WWE, well, F at the time, and WCW, and also a little sidebar, Vincent Mann from Fayetteville, North Carolina, went to ECU out of Greenville. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, not, not only, uh, I mean, really the Monday Night War really didn't begin. Certainly, I mean, Ted Turner made he's always said that the uh that his empire was always built on three things andy griffin reruns the atlanta braves and wrestling uh he had georgia championship wrestling on for the longest time 605 on the superstation the mothership baby as uh as, as uh dusty rose used to say and uh you know vince actually attempted to buy that time slot uh, uh perpetrating what was called black saturday um and eventually he, you know, Vince, and, and the whole, and basically what you said is, is exactly right. There, 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 there's some nuance to it. But the Monday Night War you mentioned, it started in 1995 when uh, Ted Turner gave uh, Eric Bischoff two hours every Monday night for Monday Nitro to go head to head against Vince McMahon. And that's when, and for six years, it was in our formative years. I mean, that was some of the, uh, some of the most, I mean, we could probably, Go go word for word on some, on some Ric Flair or Hulk Hulk Hogan promos. Yeah, you, and you I'm gonna give you a confession that's probably gonna shock you. During that run, I never watched WCW. Never. Really? I was strictly a WWE guy. The closest I came to watching WWE, oh, but well, <laughs> the closest I came to watching WCW during that time was when that episode of Raw, when DX took over the Norfolk scope and tried to raid oh, Monday yeah. Nitro with the tank outside. Oh yeah, Triple Triple H uh, on on the we are taking over Monday Nitro. 
<laughs> yeah, that was the closest I ever came to watching WCW. But a lot of my friends that watched both said WCW had the better storylines. They were they were much more com- much more compelling and reality based. Um, I think uh, a lot of times they, you know, like from like ninety eight to about ninety nine when Vince Russo was at his at his uh, most insane, you know, uh, choppy choppy pee pee, for example. Um, <laughs> but uh, you know, and uh, you know, Marlene Marlena and the miscarriage and Pillman with the gun. Pillman's got a gun. You know, I mean, it, it, I mean, it got insane. But you know, at, at the heart of WCW, it was it was mostly it was power struggle for who, who was going to get to the top. WWE, it was it was a lot of car crash TV. Except really for Vince, for Vince, for Vince and uh, and Austin that feud. Um, but even then, it got it, it got a little got a little crazy uh, near the end of it. Um, but problem was, you know, I think NWO was getting so bloated and, um, you know, a lot of the talent that was on the come up to Chris Jericho's, your Chris Benoit's, I will say it, you know, at the time, you know, we, we didn't know he was going to snap like he did. Uh, but uh, Eddie Guerrero, Dean Malenko, Billy Kidman, uh, Rey Mysterio, that entire cruiserweight division, um, what were some of the tag teams that, that, were, uh, that, that were coming out of there? I, uh, I remember uh, really loving Harlem Heat. Um, Booker T you know, and, uh, and Stevie Ray, uh, you know, it, it was, you know, and, and of course, I mean, you know, yeah, a lot of it was, you know, I mean, especially like a Dungeon of Doom era in 1995, I mean, 95, Starcade, you remember this? It's, uh, well, you didn't because you, were watching, you weren't watching WWE. In 1995, the main event of Starcade, their, their, their WrestleMania and it predated WrestleMania, was uh, with Hulk Hogan defending the WCW World Heavyweight title, Against the wrestler formerly known as Brutus the Barber Beefcake, so they were really trying to trying to bring the eighties and force it force it through in the nineties and on some parts of the card. But you know, it, yeah, and the but, one thing I found interesting was that a lot of the wrestlers that you mentioned ended up working for Vince or end up working at WCW going to Vince and vice versa because I remember the big controversy I think it was 95 or 96 Survivor Series. You probably know where I'm going with this. The Montreal Screwdrop. 97. It was 97, 97. that happened. Um, yeah, Bret Hart. Uh, Cliff Notes version for non-wrestling fans. Um, so Bret Hart was the WWF champion at the time, and um, Shawn Michaels was a challenger. And once upon a time, uh, Shawn Michaels said to uh, Bret Hart, uh, "You may put me over, but I will never put you over." And Shawn Michaels, though one of the most talented wrestlers of all time, not the most beloved in the locker room. He was uh, high on the pills at the time, shall we say? Um, but Bret Hart got a very lucrative deal, three million dollars. Uh, he got like a two-year, $3 million contract to go to WCW after being reneged on a 20-year contract from the WWE and Vince McMahon. So uh, he's on his way out in Brett, and he has the belt. Now, he's not going to drop the belt to Shawn Michaels because they had built the storyline, you remember this very well, Jamie, that Bret Hart was a hero, a, a baby face in Canada, but in the United States, he was a heel. He did not want to lose in Canada. Seems kind of stupid, wrestling is predetermined, but if wins and losses at the time kind of did count. He didn't want to, you know, be a loser on the way out. But, you know, he still had the hardware, and, you know, <laughs> it's not, I mean, there's there is there is a history of a, of 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 belts uh, going to other organizations and being uh, decimated. Uh, Medusa infamously took the WWF title and uh, dropped it into a garbage can on an episode of Monday Nitro. Um, and Vince flat out just didn't trust Eric Bischoff, probably on that reason alone. So, how are we going to get this belt off of uh, Shawn Michaels? Bret Hart's finish is the Sharpshooter which is this uh, combination crab leg lock hold. Look it up, do a Google image. Uh, Rick Martell. What's that? <laughs> I said Rick Martell. I think his finisher was the Boston Crab, I believe. Rick Martell. 
Yeah, so Chris Jericho in the walls of Jericho. Just think of that, except uh, it's kind of a step over toehold into that kind of a uh, kind of a move. But uh, yeah, Google image, you'll get the general idea. So after what was objectively a uh, you know a really great brawl, hard hitting match, Brett, Brett and Sean were always magic in the ring. I mean, see WrestleMania 12 and their Iron Man match. But uh, he, so he gets so both of these men are in the ring. Shawn Michaels begins to execute. The sharpshooter steps over, locks it in. <laughs> no way Brett's going to tap to this. Earl Hebner, the referee, calls for the belt in unison with Vince McMahon. That's how they got the belt off of, uh, off of Brett Hart. And coincidentally, and this is, this is the source of a lot of uh, conspiracy theories, Brett Hart was actually filming a documentary at the time. So we got to see a lot of what the aftermath was backstage after Brett Fits in Vince McMahon's face, destroys the announce tables, breaking, breaking the old tube monitors, you know, the, the ones that were about the size of a, a cinder block, throws them down, stands center the ring, and basically spells out WCW. They had gone off the air at the time, but the cameras were still rolling. Goes backstage, punches Vince McMahon in the face on the way out. Sean and uh, Triple H, uh, his, uh, his uh, running buddy and now the COO of WWE, uh, deny ever knowing anything when, of course, they were in on it. And uh, off went Brett, and uh, <laughs> the, the rest is history. Brett, uh, Brett makes his money, becomes a champion, gets concussed, gets out of the business. Vince McMahon cuts the infamous Brett Screwed Brett promo. Shawn Michaels is nuclear heat in Canada for the rest of his life. And that basically turned the business on its head. You cannot talk about professional wrestling and its history and where it is now and why it is where it is now without talking about the Montreal Screwjob. Yeah, who knew that Shawn Michaels would be like Christian Leitner in Canada where he cannot stop and take a break at the gas station bathroom or anywhere without people giving him dirty looks and dirty stares? <laughs> shout, out to Chris, shout out to Christian Lehner. I still don't care for Christian Lehner to this day. Tar Heels for life, but um, that's a whole nother story for a whole nother day. Now back on to the music. What led you wanting to go to Nashville, Tennessee, the country music capital of the world? And then first coming in, you're like, man, I'm here, and there's everybody that's has the same goal as me, trying to get their song showcased by some of the big writers producing the country music, and that I can etch my name in lights and one day perform on that stage at the opera. Well, uh, it was always kind of in my mind. Um, uh, it's funny you mention that. I meant I uh, came out to Nashville uh, about 2004. Six, I had just turned 21. Um, my, my dad, in his infinite wisdom, said, okay, the kids are now over 21. We can now take them to, uh, to Nashville and go to the bars. So, um, <laughs> so we toured the Ryman um, when we got here. And I remember they do tours during the day. I, I remember you mentioning you, you, you toured the Opry. The yeah, Ryman we did the Opry, yeah. So, but, uh, so, they have during the day they have the uh, the old uh, barn backdrop from the Grand Ole Opry WSM 650 uh, written on it. They have a piano. They have uh, the old uh, Shore uh, 55 SM microphone. Uh, you know the one with the grill, the one you can probably see Elvis with, or if you see my live streams recently, I use. And um, they have two guitars on either side. I pick it up, strum it. Sounds like it's in tune, and I just. When am I going to get the chance again? I bust into uh, uh, Folsom Prison by, uh, by Johnny Cash. When I finish, there are about 20 people who have just kind of come to the front of the stage. That little, uh, that little circular stairs that kind of spreads out and gets wider. And uh, they're right in the front of the stage. They're clapping. A woman comes up, hands me a piece of paper. It's like, I want your autograph before you become famous. So I remember signing it, and uh, I remember telling the story that the next month at Thanksgiving. I'm like, uh, okay, saying it, Ryman, check, got an autograph, check, standing ovation, check. And my dad, ever the ever cynic, he's like, did you get a check? I'm working on it! 
So, fast forward, fast forward about uh, 10 years at that point. Um, I had I graduated college, I quit my day job, and I was, do, I was doing, doing, the, doing the get full time. Um, I had a friend in Nashville. And uh, I came out, uh, I came out one weekend and um, not only did I fall in love with the town, not only did I feel like I was a pretty girl in Los Angeles uh, when it came to songwriting, I knew I wasn't the only one. Um, I fell in love with my, with a friend that put me up. Her name is Haley and we've been married uh, two and a half years now. Congratulations. Um, and uh I'll, I'll say this, you know, I, I didn't, I didn't come out to Nashville for her, but she is the reason I stay. Um, and, uh, but you know, it was a, it was a bit of a shell shock because yes, everybody was good. Everybody was good, but everybody also, it, uh, unless you're like on your, you're living to get the so-called one or two spots, uh, that are available per record label or music row. It is a community out here. You, it, it, and, a, and a very small, very close knit one. I mean, I can, uh, I'll tell you this story. Last week, I, uh, uh, one of my fraternity brothers um, was uh, having a bat was at a bachelor party uh, at a bar downtown called Nudie. So I managed to get in. I, I knew the girl on, I knew the girl who was singing on stage. I knew her drummer. He had played with me. I get up to the rooftop. The duo, we had, uh, you know, I think we had probably done a couple of gigs over at Tootsie uh, when, I, when I got up there, when, when I first got here. And um, eventually, if you stick around long enough, you know, you start to know enough people and up to the point in which you can start, you know, get, getting some gigs down on Broadway. One of them has a studio, most likely, hence how I got, how I met my drum, the drummer, uh, Jack Gavin, uh, who is a, uh, who actually, his credits include 15 years with the Charlie Daniels band. Uh, he spent another couple years with Tracy Lawrence and Tanya Tucker. Um, and he, and he has his own home studio and he uh, helped me produce uh, the Vagabond EP. Uh, but I met him through, uh, oddly enough, one of the guys who wrote two of the songs with me on this very EP, Trenton Chandler. Knew him, he was kind of one of the main guys over at uh, over at Christie's, and we built a friendship like that. You thought we? I mean, uh, one thing that I always kind of rolled my eyes at when the professors, when Professor Donaldson, I think especially, was saying that the thing about the thing about the this business or any business, it's really all about who you know. And I was just a little, I was, you know, I mean, I was, I was a little older than most, but I was kind of, I kind of rolled my eyes like, come on, it's. It, I mean, I, I can blow all these guys out of the water. I don't need to network. Everybody can blow everybody out of the water in Nashville. Yes, you have to make a couple of friends. Yes, you need, you need to be uh, somebody to help you up when you're down. And even when you're not down, it's always good to get down with somebody. So, you know, it. Uh, I don't know. I kind of, I kind of got off on a ramble. I hope that's it. No, that no, 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 no. It's all good at your time, man. So pretty much don't burn bridges and treat everybody like how you want to be treated because you never know when you may need them. So would you say it's a lot harder when you just coming in if you don't already have those connections because it almost kind of seems like in order to get in the game, you got to know somebody that can vouch for you and maybe refer you to some folks? Well... <laughs> I would say that it is, it, I would assume it is easier in that aspect. When I got here, I really didn't know anybody. So um, I, in, in truth, all I had really were a couple of, uh, a couple of demos, a couple of, uh, a couple of songs that I had written, a beat up old guitar, and uh, a way of getting gigs that I, that I figured out how to do in North Carolina. And it was really as simple as this. Go into the bar, find who, uh, find who does the music. Hey, I'm, hey, I'm Craig Beltry. How can, I, how can I play here? What do you need from me? Here's my card. May I get your information? Okay, I'll send you some information. 
and usually a correspondence will get will get there. Um, I'll tell you this one. I, I, I recommend one thing. I recommend that everybody does does at least once in their life. Do a sales job. Do at least one sales job. I don't care if you're. I, I don't recommend doing door to door, but uh, you know, take a sales course. Maybe maybe try to sell some insurance on the time. Maybe even try try to recall your days back to when you were selling uh selling a popcorn for Boy Scouts, cookies for the girls. Oh, those candy yeah. fundraisers for elementary school. Oh yeah, those those, those annoying little twerks. But yeah, um, <laughs> trust me, we I I I walk I can't I can't uh, I can't walk. I used to be able to not walk six feet without somebody. It's like, hey, do you want a, you want a candy bar to help for AAU? It's like. Mm, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, stickers are better, but anyway. Uh, <laughs> now nah, I uh, kid, but uh, you know it, it. It'll at least give you the uh, it'll at least give you the opportunity to get out there and uh, you know at least learn how to not be afraid to, to talk to somebody. And at least there's something that one thing that I always learned uh, through, through the one or two sales jobs that I've had in my life. Assume the sale. Go in there. Hi, I'm somebody. Uh, I can I can do this. I can help you with that. Um, what do you have available? So, you know, and uh, you know, I I kind of carried that uh, that uh, that attitude with me. And though I wasn't, uh, you know, I wasn't exactly packing in Donatos over on Broadway in in Nashville or uh, or. or or the slider house, but uh, you know, it, it got me. It got my foot in the door. I was able to, you know, take some take some tangible vi video. Got me used to what a natural touristy kind of crowd is. And once I eventually uh, walked into an open mic uh, back in, I want to say July 2017, um, I uh, I was I was ready to uh, hit tootsies with the with my best shot, and that basically gave me a gave me the key to Broadway when yeah. I did that. Yeah, and uh, as the saying goes, country is nothing but three chords and the truth. I grew up listening to country music here and there, but really got into it more so after watching Ken Burns' documentary on country music and the way that it was very layered, talking about the legends that came before, like your Ernest Tubbs, your Patsy Clines, your Hank Williams Sr., Garth, Reba, Alan Jackson, George Strait, we could go on and on. And country is a drama where if you're good, they'll accept you, whether they like it or not. Because what I found interesting for me was hearing Charlie Pride talk about his story and him being African-American going into country. And as we all know, some country music fans are very conservative. And when you see this black guy come out to the Opry, and you're looking like, well, he don't look like us. What is he doing here? And <laughs> letting the music, you know, speak for itself. And, you know, just seeing the new country now with Florida Georgia line. And you mentioned Chris Stapleton, Sam Hunt, mm -hmm. Kane Brown, Jimmy Allen. And it seems like the lines have been blurred to where they're mixing pop, R&B, rap. It's pretty much not your granddaddy's country, like Willie Nelson and... Ronnie Millsap and the likes of those guys. Well, I, I agree with that entirely, but I would also say that the lines were never really there to begin with. I mean, you listen to, I mean, was Johnny Cash a rock and roller all along? I mean, he started at a Memphis label, didn't come, didn't start out in Nashville. Buck Owens was a, you know, out, out in Bakersfield, California, about as far as Nashville as you can go without crossing the ocean. Um, but, you know, it, it was still based in R and B. It was still kind of kind of shuffling. I mean, the Beatles cover cover a song or two of it. So you know that that availability to crossover. Um, David Lee Roth once said said that said that rock and roll music is high velocity folk. And in in, in essence, when you really break it down, blues is a form of folk. Um, you know, uh, bluegrass is a form of folk music. Uh, it's really just a matter of the region and uh, and the rhythm that comes with it. So the fact that that, that everything is crossing over, I always kind of we talk wrestling. I everybody kind of has a has a way of saying it's like, oh God, it wasn't as good as it was in the good old days when it was pure. Let me tell you something about country music, and you'll recognize this watching that documentary. 
Uh, if you want purity, go to the Carter family or go to Jimmy Rogers. It hasn't been pure since. So every, everything that is crossing over, everything that is uh, becoming that amalgamation, it's not only a great thing, but it's also an inevitable thing. I mean, we, I mean, we, we, we also kind of a similar uh, kind of show. In fact, I would say that I was inspired by, by the time machine to do Vinyl Street Vinyl. Uh, you know, everything that we love, we have access to more than ever. At the time, it was mostly through, through MP3s. It was kind of the dawn of what iTunes was becoming. And now we live in the age of Spotify and streaming Google, and all that stuff. All that streaming stuff. We have, a, we have full access to it now. Um, we, so we have heard everything. And therefore, as, as, as myself as a writer, I like to think that everything is kind of, kind of blending into each other. If I want to you know, pull more of something out, cool. But at the end of the day, I mean, there's only two kinds of music, good and bad. Yeah, it's like gumbo. You got all these different genres coming and mixing together. And when you put the gumbo in the bowl, lay it over with the right rice, you taste it, it's oh so good. Because when I went to Memphis, I took a tour of Sun Records. And yeah. I was super hyped going in there, just knowing the legacy of Sun, the history. And we got to see and touch the mic that Elvis Carl Perkins, the rest of the Million Dollar Quartet. And the one thing I found interesting was I've that, that model microphone now. <laughs> yeah, and the one interesting thing about Sun is that it's still a working studio after tours yeah. are over. You know, 3-6 Mafia and pretty much anybody who comes through Memphis still uses that to this day to record. They even have, I think, the board that you two use to record the, I think, Shake, Rattle, and Hum album at. Rattle and Hum, yeah. Rattle and Hum, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's, I mean, it, it is, uh, I, I'm, and it, may, and it may have just been the hype that the tour guy was putting up there, but you go in there and you can just, okay, maybe I shouldn't be that, be that flippant because I've gone into enough uh, rooms in Nashville to just kind of feel the, the sound waves that have reverberated in the past. Um, so, you go in there and you can, you can, you talk about Carl Perkins, you can feel Carl Perkins in there. You can feel Johnny Cash in there. You can feel Elvis Presley in there. So much so, I, I, uh, <laughs> uh, I, I sang up that last uh, part of it's now or never into, into the microphone just so I could hear, just so I could hear the acoustic of it. And it was, <clears throat> God, it, uh, get get me uh, get me back there. Uh, my uh, uh, for, for bookings, uh, contact Sarah at debutentertainment.com. <laughs> yeah, man. And the one thing that I wanted to mention too was while I was in Memphis, I got a chance to go check out Al Green's church and come to find out he was actually preaching on that day because a lot of the members were saying that um, you catch called him at the right time because he rarely is in town. So we were sitting like three feet away from the man. And there were a tour bus of people from all over the world, I guess it's a tourist attraction. Church is a tourist attraction, how ironic. Um, they were all sitting in the middle row, but I was trying my hardest to be respectful in the house of, of the Lord, but seeing Al Green, and I'm like, this man I grew up listening to is preaching, and he sounds just like the record. And I was just amazed that like, wow, I'm just seeing them in the flesh and just the musical history of not only Memphis, but Nashville and even Eastern Tennessee, like Pigeon Forge, I mean, one of the greatest singer songwriters, not just for a female, but period, Dolly Parton from Pigeon Forge. I mean, she got her own theme park for Pete's sake. Still, uh, technically, but Pigeon Forge right here by, so yeah. <laughs> Yeah, man, but uh, country music, man, a genre that is definitely an American treasure, an American tradition. Now, do you notice a big difference when writing, let's say, a song that's supposed to be going towards a pop market than for a country market? Is there a difference as far as chorus structures, um, putting bridge and choruses in? Because we know that those two different audiences have two distinctly different ear ears and hear songs differently. You know, it's funny you mention that. I'm actually coming across a, across a similar, uh, I had a similar conversation with a producer 
because uh, uh, once uh, once we get clear once we get clear this year uh, in, in the Vagabond EP, I'm going to be releasing a single record of this basically. So every three months, you're going to get a new song out of me. Um, once one of the songs that we're uh, we're tar- targeting uh, is uh, is a song that uh, that I wrote for my wife called Yes. Yeah. Uh, we have two mixes for it. One's kind of more of a guitar driven mix. The other is more of a fiddle steel kind of mix. Um, when I wrote that song, I had I had a Paul Simon kind of vibe in mind before it. So once you get it, uh, once you get a song, at least for me, I don't go into a song most of the time trying to write to a genre or write it to a uh, to a certain subset. Usually, I kind of have kind of have a vibe going with the song okay it kind of sounds like this artist i tend to go kind of go mo- more to the particular artist um one of the songs i'm going to be releasing next year kind of has a george Strait kind of vibe to it in fact uh it, some might even say it's a full-on ripoff stay tuned but uh i uh i don't i don't i mean i i tend not to tend not to go towards that style and besides when you get it, when you start collaborating with people, their influences start to come into it, um, and maybe we go this way with it, maybe we go that way with it, maybe we add, uh, maybe we add a dulcimer, maybe we add a mandolin, maybe we add uh, a cello. Who knows? Um, but it, uh, I, it, I can never. It's hard to explain how how I go into it because usually. It's usually usually it's a phrase. Usually it's something that I'm, you know, tooling around on guitar with, and you know, it just it just kind of comes to me. And uh, if if I can if I can reference something I learned from Billy Joel, if there's some or uh, Raymond Zerk of the Doors, if there's something that I can reference um, and and bring it into my music uh, just to kind of give it something to stand on and maybe improve on it, you know, I. I, I, tend, I tend to do that. If it's, if it's a country song, cool. If it's a rock song, cool. If it's, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> if it's something uh, something more more hip hop oriented, I haven't dove that dove into that uh, pool yet. But uh, if uh, you know, it, it, where, wherever the uh, wherever the uh, wherever the the song takes me, I think I, I think a, I think most of the writers I speak uh, that I've spoken to or have read. On a method, uh, pretty much would, would tell you the same. It's, you know, it's, you know, we, we follow we follow the narrative, and we follow the uh, the flow of what's uh, what's coming out of us. Right, and I know I don't know if you are familiar with the show Songland, right on NBC. Uh, I've heard of it. I haven't watched it yet. Yeah, I find it quite interesting because it has Ryan Tedder from One Republic, Esther Dean, and Shane Manoli, oh. and just in the process of what the up and coming songwriter has to go through in order to get their song pitched and to see them rework a song when you think that you may have it all together, but they say, no, put this verse here, change this word here. And this a complete process when you are working on a song, just the strategicness of knowing what to place when and change a chord here and change this vocal here. And it just gives you a whole new appreciation for the songwriting process. Well, yeah, I mean, every every English teacher that I think you and I have ever had will tell you the the first draft is never the best draft, and usually that's the first <laughs> you forget that when you get to college. At least I at least I did on a couple of papers, but uh, but yeah, you, I mean you, I mean you workshop it. You, you you put you put it through the grinder. You show it to a couple of friends. You put. You, I mean, this is one thing I learned. You know, doing all those open mics in uh, in Greensboro. You know, I'm. Can tell you, I can tell you a couple of songs over over the years that I just let <laughs> left dying and bleeding, and whatever uh, whatever entrails that I can that I could uh, could salvage will usually would usually show up in other songs. But you know, I mean, once uh, once you put pad to paper, it doesn't it doesn't mean your work is done by any for sure. Yeah, and that means every idea you have is not trash. Because I mean, I look at what Prince did because you know when they opened up Paisley Park and the vault that he has of material upon material upon material because there was a Red Bull Academy interview with Susan Rogers, who was his engineer. She said that he always kept everything recorded. 
he was always performing or recording and it just shows with all the work that he put out even the stuff that never got released oh yeah the stories that the story that uh kevin smith uh, the director uh, uh told about his time when he visited uh when he was going to be producing a documentary about uh, about Prince, uh, I mean Paisley Park was every inch of that room was wired for sound. So if he so he if, if the inspiration hit him, he didn't have he didn't have to reach for a recorder or a guitar. He could just get started on a demo wherever in his house, be it the uh, be it the kit be it the kitchen or the john. So yeah, he was always eat sleeping and breathing music and. As you and I know that he had a big rule of anybody that was in his camp, no outside production, it's just me and me only. Well, we know the story with Jimmy Jam, Terry Lewis. They were in Atlanta working on, I believe, Just Be Good To Me for the SOS band. And Atlanta had a freak snowstorm. They couldn't get to San Antonio in time for the time gig. So Prince and Jerome had to play off stage because they weren't there. And then they ended up getting fired, but that led to all of their work that they did with SOS Band, Human League, Alexander O'Neill, Janet, New Edition, and being one of the most celebrated songwriting production duos of all time. Oh yeah, I mean, I mean, you mentioned, you mentioned Human League. That that's that's a group that I can that I can that I can dig deep and always find uh, find something new out of them for sure. Um, uh, they can't. They, not a band that really used guitar. They had probably one of the better, uh, better sounding, uh, new wavy kind of songs with uh, with Lebanon. Uh, I, I, I was listening to that one recently, but uh, yeah, they, they in, in, incredi- incredibly slept on slept on a group for sure. Yeah, don't you want me? That Crash album was a dope album. But I remember Jam, uh, Jimmy Jam was saying that um, when they were recording the vocals for Human. They tried to get Paul to sing more soulful because, you know, when he sings, it's very robotic, just like this. And they wanted to get the soul out. And he was kind of like, mm, I don't know if I could do it. And then they had to squeeze a part in for one of the girls in the group because she was like, hey, I want to get a part too. But it ended up becoming a big hit for Human League, got airplay on not only pop oh, wow. radio, but R&B radio as well. And I find it funny now that for our generation that Backstreet Boys and NSYNC are considered retro because when I was teaching, right, I had a student in a class I was subbing for. She had on a t-shirt that was the debut U.S. debut album cover for NSYNC. And I was like, yeah. dope shirt. And it's just funny to see how like Backstreet Boys and NSYNC, they are considered old school for this generation. Well, I mean, we, I mean, both of us grew up in the, in the middle of that phenomena, you know, the whole, the whole TRL, uh, I mean, we talked, we talked about we were exposed to everything. How, how many times, can you, how many times can you really look at a, look at a music show or any kind of, a, any kind of modern pop radio today for sure. Um, and, and listen and see within the same, within the same program, 10 music videos, Eminem, Blink-182, Korn, Britney Spears, Backstreet Boys, and Insync. All Bizkit. within that. And Limp Bizkit. <laughs> Let's forget about this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, man. But it's just crazy how like that whole team pop phenomenon, even though they were ragging about it at the time, it's looked at now finally in special. I mean, just to think about what everybody I'm did, even though it was pop, it was good pop. Really good pop. I mean, I will I will put no strings attached up against up against any of the best pop albums that uh, that ever uh, that ever played. Um, and by the way, and by the way, they did. Uh, you mentioned that first record, killer cover of "Just Got Paid." Yeah, which was covered by the late, originally done by Johnny Kemp, rest in peace, Kemp, produced yeah. by uh, Teddy Riley. And to think about what Backstreet and Insync did, they were just an extension of what. New Kids on the Block was doing, who was an extension of what New Edition was doing. And to think about what New Edition did, where all six members have solo success and they were able to come back together, have success again. And then when they released the miniseries in 2017, did crazy numbers 
for BT Bobby Brown's solo story on BT did crazy numbers. They got their star in the Hollywood Walk of Fame. And I think the only thing missing for New Edition's resume is to be in Cleveland in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame because you can't deny their contributions to the music. Oh, absolutely! You, can, you cannot deny the contributions, and it's got some killer songs. Uh, by the way, by the way, you'll be proud of me. I have played "If There Isn't Love" before in, on Broadway before. So. Dope. <laughs> Dope, 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 man. And then, um, you know, when I was interviewing Danny from New Kids, man, um, it was very, very real. He was saying how, you know, a lot of people looked at them as, oh, you guys are just doing what new But no, they took their own feel and had more pop and R&B influence. And that led to the infamous, shall I say now, Lou Pearlman to say, I'm going to do the same thing that, new kids doing but have their look but the sound of boys to men and that led to backstreet boys and i mean also not only the pop in the u.s but the pop in the uk was just as good at that time because i felt take that should have blown up more here in america and i was glad to see robbie williams have some type of success once he launched solo here in the states well i mean we got america really got caught the uh, caught the tail of it i actually my sister, anyway, she was she was the uh, she was the pop princess uh, in the in the household, so she had all the pop records. But yeah, nobody else that record. Yeah, that was that was some solid stuff. Sure, the opener was a banger. I still play uh, still play back for good. I mean, that's that's an incredible song. The title track is a uh, is a really uh, really. I can still I still have a little misty because it is such a uh, such a nice sentimental ballad. I'm surprised that more people don't play it at their weddings and anniversaries, to be honest with you. Yeah, and I know Boyz II Men, they just covered um, Back for Good on an album that they did a couple of years ago. Now, I don't know if you know this or not about Bye Bye Bye, but it was originally intended for Five, but they passed on it. You remember, really? the, you remember the group Five, right? When the when lights the go light, out? When the lights go out. Yeah, I remember yeah, that. Yeah, Bye 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 was originally intended for them, and they passed up on it. And uh, Simon, Simon Cowell, he said that that was the song that could have broke them over the top here in America because they had moderate success here, but they didn't have that one song that took them over the edge. And really, a boy band out of the UK didn't really have that big success here in America until One Direction. Well, I mean, I think I mean, I mean, I remember that song, and I'm and I'm thinking, I mean, the, I mean, they were very synth heavy, and so was uh, so was I mean. The, the distinction that you can put between uh, Backstreet Boys, they had had a little bit more in, instrumentation, but it wasn't really, you know, high end synth heavy. In sync, very synthy, and I think Five was kind of an offshoot of that. So it makes sense that they, they, they would have that Bye 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 made that parallel move for sure. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, Justin went off to do his solo career, Justified great record which i felt that oh, whole album was okay. the album that michael that jackson never record. got to record because <laughs> i think i read somewhere that rock your body was originally intended for michael jackson that makes sense too i mean i mean Timber, timberland was very high in demand so that that makes sense that uh, a song like that would have would have uh, would have piqued michael's interest and and honestly the song that he released around that same time uh, that uh the certainly shame Bill Kelly wrote for him. You rock my world certainly has uh, has a similar vibe to it. Mm. Um, but uh, I think, uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, what did you think of? I mean, I I've, I've only heard uh, I only heard filthy from the last record, and that's all I needed to hear. What did you think of of, of Timberlake's last last record? Uh, Man from the Woods. I have not that's heard it, but I know it's kind of like Justin is one of those artists where he doesn't want to stay in the box. He want to constantly keep pushing and evolving and not stick with the same sound from Justified and Expand. But from what I heard from Filthy, I thought it was a okay record, but I really think that once COVID lifts and everything, probably plays calls to everybody else, but hey, we need to get this reunion money. <laughs> well, I mean, they, they, did, they did some semblance of it at the Grammys a couple of years ago, right? I think it was the MTV VMAs when Justin yeah, got the yeah. Video Vanguard Award, but it was like really, really short because they just did Gone briefly, did Bye Bye Bye, and that was it, but not like a full-on NSYNC medley, which I felt would have been more appropriate since that's where, you know, you got your start. 
Kind of, kind of a callback to what the, well, they, what they could have done is what they did with uh, with New Edition. They could have had Ralph come out and do a song, Bill Bibbs Vogue come out and do a song, Johnny come out and do a song. Which I Bobby thought which is how you should do it because that performance on the MTV Music Awards in 1990, that's how you do a reunion performance. You have all your solo acts come out, do your stuff, and then hit them at the end with the group medley and like I said earlier, you know, if it wasn't for new edition, there'll be no new kids, no Backstreet Boys, in sync, 98 degrees, and all the other male pop and RB groups that has entertained us for the past three to four decades. Now, are you surprised at how big K pop has gotten here in America and the phenomenon with BTS? Uh, you know, I'm, I'm not insanely familiar with BTS, but I, I kind of caught the uh, caught the craze before it uh, came on. I was kind of listening uh, to, uh, oh, uh, oh, who's the one? That, uh, Big Bang. Uh, oh, ba ba I thought Bad Boy should have broken in America. That was my I record. I was song. like, yeah, I was cool. like, had Drake or Rick Ross or somebody got on a remix of that, that probably could have gotten them here in the U.S. And I know that for BTS, they have the right look. Right, sound, and then also we look at with the way that the culture is now, where everybody wants to see themselves being represented. That the Asian community has been underserved, and we got our own group. And then with the success of Fresh Off the Boat, that was on ABC. Nora from Queens on Comedy Central, great show by the way. It's definitely a good time for, no matter what your culture is, to put some out and say, "Hey, here it is. It's for you by us." And we're going to put it out there, and so that everybody can enjoy it. And that's and that's a wonderful thing. But the thing that uh, that kind of kind of latched me into into that stuff is like you know it has it has a you know you know it had a it had a pulse to it. It had life to it. It was it was even even though I mean I mentioned I hate this love song. It was saying something rather. I mean that's that's the best the, the best kind of music is something that that. Says something negative, but you're still dancing to it. You know, mm. uh, you know, Lady Gaga comes to mind immediately when you when when you talk about that. You know, just dance. There's there's kind of a desperation to it. Um, but uh, even even in in the lighter stuff, uh, I remember this one. I can't remember the girl group that did it, but this, this is a song called Mistress Action. But it's just it, it's so it's fun. It is fun. It is it is vibrant. It is colorful and. Yeah, I'm, I'm all for it, for sure. Right, and uh, another thing that I wanted to mention as well was that also during this time, not only were the male groups exploding, but on the female side, they were exploding as well. I mean, I was looking up the Spice Girls numbers. They are the second biggest selling female group of all time. Second wow. biggest. Thing. And 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 Emma Bunton was like one of my first crushes of all time. Right. So, yeah, Speaking that's... of Baby Spice, she's now married to uh, one of the members of the British R&B boy group Damage. Um, Jay, they didn't have success here in America, but they were huge over in the UK. And um, I did an interview recently with uh, KG. He was a member of the '90s R&B pop UK group M and Eight. He told me a story of how Columbia Records yeah. over in the UK had a chance to sign the Spice Girls and they passed. And that's how Virgin got them. Oh God. And like like Burton needed the money. But uh, uh, you talk about the talk about the uh, British girl group. You ever listen to Little Mix? Yeah, Little Mix came from the UK X Factor along with, as we mentioned, One Direction, um, Boy Group, JLS and uh, Leona Lewis. Yeah. Yeah, they, yeah, they, they're. I mean, goodness gracious, I could, I could probably still, uh, still bump, uh, uh, move like crazy. I mean, I used to play that when I was doing karaoke, uh, DJing when it, uh, back in Charlotte. I, I throw that on there. Nobody knew what it was, but I'm like, what is wrong with you? Why are you not dancing? <laughs> this is right, awesome. Right. And you mentioned Charlotte real quick. We cannot forget these four men that were church singers, but once uh, they hooked up with P Diddy. They turned into R and B superstars, and I'm talking about Jodeci. I know Casey and JoJo very well. I think every one of us got a first slow dance to All My Life, but uh, yeah, I, I, I kind of miss the Jodeci, uh, the Jodeci phenomenon. But I definitely, uh, I, I, I definitely have a, I, I definitely have. I remember crying. That was crazy. Oh, I think, I think, I think the name was 
I don't remember the name. <laughs> right, but just the fact that, you know, when you found out that they're from North Carolina, I was just like, oh, snap, they're from North Carolina and they're doing it big in the industry and just see where North Carolina is now represented in terms of music. It's definitely a site, you know, with Ninth Wonder and Rhapsody and The Baby and DJ Luke Nasty. Petey Pob. Petey Pablo, of course, raise your shirt up, take it off, spin it like a helicopter, and just everybody that came out of the Tar Heel State. I mean, it just feels good to finally see North Carolina finally get some shine, get some recognition. Uh, well, I hope I'm, I'm, hoping, I'm giving, uh, giving uh, as much. I mean, I'm wearing a picture, but I hope hopefully they, hopefully I'll, I'll be called, I'll be called, uh, called as one of the, one of their own someday for sure. And yeah, uh, yeah, man, you're on your way, man. So tell us a little bit more about Vanguard, who produced it, how many songs is on it, and how people can copy. It. Well, uh, it's, it's it's vagabond. Uh, it's, it's, vagabond. A, it's a four song, it's a four song EP. Um, it's, uh, it's available on all the streaming services. Um, uh, you know, spot, we mentioned a couple of them uh, already uh, unsolicited uh, in this interview. Um, I, uh, I, do have, I do have some hard copies available. Uh, if you contact me personally, official at gmail.com, uh, you'll, get, you'll get a uh, nice uh, little sleeve uh, designed by a friend of mine who is currently living out of Austin, Texas. His name is uh, Jeremy Zeldries. And he, uh, he, he basically, uh, the front cover was basically just me sitting at my kitchen table with a coffee cup. And he transitioned uh, this uh, sketch, uh, graphically designed, uh, to put me at a bar with a shot glass in my hand. Um, did, did this very lovely back cover as well. Um, if, you, uh, if you do contact me, I'll uh, personally autograph it for you. Uh, if you still want to contact me personally, um, I do have the files available. And for $5, I'll send them to you personally. That way, uh, we're not pay- I'm, you, I, you don't have to go through a middleman to get those files. And, uh, and, and uh, iTunes isn't taking that. Uh, taking a full cut but it is available on all those streaming services uh should you should you uh decide to uh go and uh, purchase this record it's been it's been four years in the making uh, to get the to get these four songs onto onto a record i'm very proud of it and i really hope people enjoy it all right and how has nashville been holding up due to covid because i know you know a lot of tours and performances have been postponed so how has that been affecting the whole community and yourself as a musician it's a lot of stops and starts, and I honestly think I don't. I don't think the uh, the mayor mayor uh, John Cooper is going to make it uh, out of 2020 alive if a couple, if a couple of musicians have uh, have have their way because apparently he's uh, there's there have been reports coming out that uh, uh, John Cooper doesn't think that and, and a lot of these are coming from uh, from a, a Sinclair Broadcast owned uh, news station so consider the source I would say on this one. But uh, there are there have been some emails that uh, have been traced back to the mayor's office saying that uh, he has been doctoring uh, uh, certain numbers uh, to uh, keep a lot of the uh, uh, the Broadway uh, bars closed uh, to and really affecting uh, some business that and whether it's true or not um you know I'm, I'm waiting for a few more sources to come back on that one but um, point being um, it's been a lot to answer your question directly it's a lot of, it's been a lot of stops and starts. Um, last week of June, we, uh, we managed to get from phase one where everything was closed, no live music, getting up to phase two, then the numbers spiked again, and we didn't have music, uh, up until last week, basically. In fact, uh, before we got off the with this call, uh, I just got back from a show, uh, at FGL House. So, um, it's, uh, so it, it, it's coming back, whether it's going to stick, you know, there, you know, Dr. Uh, Dr. Fauci's been saying, you know, there may still be a second meet. We're on the first wave of COVID. We maybe see, still yet see a second wave. So really, it, it's a lot of wait and see, and maybe a lot of stopping and starting until uh, until a vaccine or uh, you know we, we figure out figure out a way to uh, you know prevent it. But you know the best, and you know while while my heart goes out to uh, to my fellow musician, Lord knows I've been going crazy the last uh, two months, uh, not being able to play out and play my music, be in front of people, getting to meet people, um, you know. It's, uh, it's, you know, it, 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 you know, I, I understand the, I understand the necessity, but I also understand the necessity to make a living for, for some people. So it's, it's not a good place for anybody to be, but it will come back. And I think, I think, I think it is, it is, it is coming back. So, you know, we just, uh, I, I often say, you know, we're, 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 you know, we'll get through it. We just got to get through it. 
Yeah, you definitely have to do that. So before we close and do shout outs and everything, I got to do some sports takes with you. Um, what are your <laughs> takes on the NBA bubble and how they handled everything? And also, what do you think your Steelers are going to do this year? Because I know my Panthers are going to be trash. <laughs> well, Just throw think, 2020 away. <laughs> well, I think, I, think, I, think, I think Bridgewater is, is, is going to be a very good stopgap for you guys. I mean, Keekly, you're losing Keekly. That, that, that was that a big be, hole, so take him for Trevor. So, well, in general, um, as far as to answer your question about the NBA, uh, Los Angeles, uh, the Clippers uh, be, being ousted, that was, that was uh, my head spun. When I, when Shocker I saw. that nobody saw coming. Uh, you could see it coming because, you know, and with the, it, it was Kawhi being the leader, but nobody was really going to say that out loud with the hype train that was kind of behind. Behind it, you know, Doc Rivers. He's had, you know, kind of, kind of these similar, similar issues. The bubble in general. Um, I think that I mean, they would do well about the government's handling of it. I think sports in general have handled the uh, have handled the uh, handled the pandemic fantastically so far. Um, it's going to be interesting to see what a season next year is going to look like because again, the playoffs shouldn't be happening this late for a ba- for basketball. But um, you know, I've. You know, being in Charlotte, I've always liked. Uh, I, I loved watching Kemba Walker, despite what he and UConn did to Pitt one year. Um, but uh, I, you know, I, I always admired his play, and I, I, I really loved seeing. And you know, I've always kind of been a Celtics fan at heart. So you know, I'm really, I really like to see them uh, go all the way with it. Uh, but I'm, but I'm more so a LeBron fan. So I really think that uh, I think the Lakers uh, are basically on a cakewalk uh, to, to the end of it right now. But uh, as far as my Steelers are concerned, uh, Ben looks like Ben, and as long as Ben remains like Ben, I think they win uh, 10, maybe 11 games. They're not going to Baltimore. They're too much of a juggernaut right now, but I do, I do think the Steelers, do, with, with seven playoff spots, they almost made the playoff with Duck Hodges, for God's sake. So, um, I, think, so I, think that they, I think they really have a good shot of making it into the playoffs. Do I say they win a Super Bowl? Um, I, am, I, am not, I am not that deluded. But but I do but I do think that they, they have they have one of the best front sevens in football. Um, they they've really built up on that. And they, I mean, probably the best secondary they probably had since uh, since Troy's been there. But since Carnell Lake and, and Rod Woodson were in that were in that secondary with Minka anchoring it. So you know, I'm I'm really excited for the season. I know where I'm going to be watching the game tomorrow on my birthday. As hopefully they they trounce the Broncos. But uh, you know. Uh, yeah, so, yeah, but uh, if you want, if you want a Super Bowl prediction, um, I think it's gonna, I think it's gonna be New Orleans versus Baltimore, and I think Baltimore takes it uh, twenty-four to twenty. I think it's gonna be Kansas City because unless Mahomes get injured and with them getting Clyde edwards hilaire in, then I see nobody beating, nobody beating. Kansas City. So I think that nobody's going to beat Kansas City unless Mahomes get injured because they're very good with Clyde Edwards Elaire. So I got Kansas City over, like you said, New, I got New Orleans coming out of the NFC, but Kansas City winning going back to back. So that Andy Reid can eat up all of the Arthur Bryant's barbecue and be <laughs> handsomely paid because you know he probably went out on the town to Arthur Bryant's the power and light district in Kansas City ate up all the ribs brisket that he could find and Patrick Mahomes got his money well I mean, I mean and, and that's a lot of the re- I mean good god I, I'm glad I didn't bet on that Super Bowl because you know Mahomes happened but the, th- the question mark in that Super Bowl and the question mark going forward in that season is going to be Kansas City's defense. I think Baltimore has them beat defensively. But again, Mahomes magic. We'll we'll wait and see. But I, I think I think safe money's on Baltimore for sure. Right. You know? And I'm um, secretly I'm rooting for Cam, even though I hate the Patriots because I felt Carolina let him go a year too soon. But he looked good last week. It was against the Dolphins, and his drip is still Cam. He had on like the yellow suit where it looked very Dick Tracy ish. <laughs> And um, yeah. looked like he was about to go yeah, open up a boom boom room. <laughs> yeah, man. Who knew that his outfit right. would fly in the great Northeast? So, do you have any shouts you want to give before we conclude? And also, plug your EP, plug your social. 
Well, first of all, I want to give a, give a shout out to uh, my darling wife, Haley. Hello, dear. Uh, I want to uh, shout out to all my family, friends, and uh, fellow uh, travelers who have seen me here in Nashville. I hope to see you guys in Nashville soon, and I hope to see you guys soon, because I do plan uh, in 2021 to tour extensively. Um, I, you know, uh, have guitar, will travel. Um, every gig that I have played, I am putting up on my, uh, on my Facebook Live. I'm doing uh, what I call Live from Veltry Villa, which is basically I just sit in my office. I set up a camera and I play a couple songs for you guys. The request line is always open. You can hit me up on Venmo at craig Veltry. Uh, I have a cash app, a dollar sign Craig Veltry. Uh, if you want to go through PayPal, well, find me on Facebook. Use Facebook Pal because that actually is connected to uh, Facebook Pay. It actually, I find it's a little bit easier to use. Uh, the brand new EP is called Vagabond, Four Songs. Um, uh, and again, uh, four years really in the making to get this thing uh, out and going. It is available on all the streaming services. Um, contact me if you want an actual uh, hard copy CD. I'll just autograph it for you. $15 in the uh, continental United States and uh, it will uh, come to you. $50 includes the postage and an autograph. Um, and uh, thank you guys for all your support, for all your love over, over the years. And uh, uh, keep it locked. Uh, this, is, this is really, this, I'm proud of this. This is some of my best work, but this is the tip of the iceberg. So stay tuned on all my social media, Craig.Veltry on Instagram, at Craig.Veltry on Twitter, at Craig, at Craig Veltry Official on Facebook, which is also where you can see live from Veltry Villa, every Friday and Saturday. All right, and you can find this interview on all major streaming platforms. Video content for this interview is gonna be on my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash J85, lowercase J85. Search beyond the album cover, that's all one word. Follow the Facebook show page, facebook.com slash beyond the album cover. Ladies and gentlemen, my good friend, yes, definitely promote that, yes. My good <laughs> friend, my brother from another mother, Craig Velchy. Craig, thank you for coming on to the podcast, bro. Thank you so much for having me, Jay Mason. Uh, my best to you and your family. Thank you, man.